it's um, an honor and a great pleasure to be um, here in Birmingham in what I think is by far the best uh, department of anthropology and the best department of African studies in the country. Don't repeat that to my <laughs> colleagues at this year. But uh, um, this makes it all the more intimidating, of course, and that's why I made a point of telling the Lilita that the reason why I had chosen to speak on my new topic was because it fitted very well with the Cadbury uh, program and because I'd already spoken here on dance and I, wanted, I felt I wanted to... Um, to really um, talk about the ideas I'm thinking about at the moment, but not as presented as polished work, uh, which reflects years and years of thinking, because I'm not quite there yet, had started this project in 2011. So I, um, I looked, um, I thought a little bit about John Fage's um, work while preparing this, and I, I must say that I found it, um, I didn't find it particularly easy to relate the work that I was doing with his work, partly because he was a historian and an anthropologist, and partly because um, I don't, I'm not sure that he was particularly interested in aspects of family in Africa. But what I realized was that, on the other hand, of course he was very attentive to the interplay between social change and the insertion of Africa into global economies from the 15th century onwards first with the transatlantic slave trade and later through colonial expansion. So in a sense, there is a parallel with um, what I'm talking about today, which is the effect of circulation between Africa and Europe on social change. But today what I'm concerned with, uh, more specifically, is the ways in which people experience the absence of loved ones in contemporary Senegal, in a context in which quite a high proportion of the population lives abroad for extended periods of time. And in 2007, um, the official figures were that 480,000 <coughs> Senegalese were living abroad, which makes up about 4% of the country's population. But in fact, real figures are probably much higher since irregular migration is notoriously very difficult to measure. And more broadly, I'm concerned with the extent to which the experience of separation within families transforms what I would say is an old link in the Senegambian region between mobility and social reproduction. The material I'm using um, from which I draw is based on, like I said, an ongoing study which started really um, as a study of mixed marriage uh, rather than transnational family relationships, but I came, I came to that because these were two sides of the same coin. Now, I'm not just talking about my own family history. I have to put that as a caveat. That's often what I've been told when I started this project. Are you just documenting your own family's history as the child of Senegalese father and French mother? It's hopefully will go a bit beyond that. Um, so I've done field work since 2011, first within the, um, the, the, in the context of the Oxford Diaspora Program, which was funded by the Lady Young Trust, that was for the first two years. And I've done fieldwork mainly in France, um, in the UK, where there's a growing Senegalese community, centered mainly in London, Bristol, and Birmingham, actually. Um, and with um, repeated trips to Senegal. I also draw, of course, of previous fieldwork in Senegal. I lived in Dakar between 2002 and 2004, and visited Senegal many times as a child and a young adult to visit my paternal family. So I also draw on these uh, memories and these relationships that I established at the time. But what um, anthropological questions am I trying to address, you may ask? Well, of course, this has to do with the interrelationship between kinship, mobility, and social change more broadly. So with this current work, I'm trying to take up an old theme in anthropology and to see what happens to kinship practices in a context in which the world is increasingly, is increasingly divided between those who can move across borders easily and those who cannot. Now in Wolof speaking Senegal and in other societies of the region, um, given the emphasis on mobility, which has long been a part of everyday life, the absence of a loved one or a person of high status is accepted as part of life so long as it is not a permanent state of being. 
And there is even value, I would say, in certain forms of absence in certain contexts. But what happens then when people move further away than before, and when couples, for example, or parents and children, are stuck apart for many years at a time, for much, much longer than people anticipated? There's obviously much to say about this, but I want to make three main points today. First, I'd argue that people draw on their existing kinship repertoires to cope with the difficulties of migration, and in particular in this case, they draw on polygamy, on what Katiko has called distributed parenthood, and on a long history of marriage to Europeans in coastal Senegal. Secondly, the fact that people adapt their repertoires to new contexts does not mean that they work, in the sense it does not mean that it generates well-being, or even that people agreed with the practices from which they were drawn. This creates tensions and often a great deal of pain for the individuals concerned. And I've tried to illustrate this with the tension between rising aspirations to monogamous companionate marriage on the one hand and the draw of transnational polygamy, on the other hand. And my third point has to do with how then to conceptualize these tensions between ideology and practice. And that one is perhaps more open-ended. I suggest in the end that given the current conditions of migration, the value uh, people in Senegal have placed on absence and substitution or mediation, as I will um, call it, is now changing. So it's quite a broad theme, but my concern today is more specifically informed by the literature on changing forms of marriage in Africa, hence the link with the Cadbury program. And of course, in African monographs until the 1970s, there was plenty of excellent material on marriage and kinship, but the focus then was very much on describing systems and forms of exchange. So for example, Evans Pritchard's very detailed work on new kinship in his volume, Kinship and Marriage Among the Noor, or Radcliffe Brown's and Darren Ford's 1950 edited volume on African systems of kinship and marriage, was very much, were very much focused on systems, on the latter and systems of descent. There were important studies which laid the groundwork for um, Africanist anthropology, but little was said then on how people actually experienced intimacy with others, how they experienced being part of families of different kinds, and how they experienced being separated from them. As Jennifer Cole and Lynn Thomas have reminded us very eloquently in their uh, edited book, Love in Africa, until recently, African scholarship tended to steer very clear of love in its different forms. At the heart of this gap was an assumption that in most African societies, Marriage had nothing to do with romantic love in the European sense, and perhaps it is true that the two should not be conflated. But as the Lover in Africa book shows very well, people on the continent have expressed aspirations to different forms of love for a very long time, and have what they say, as they say, remade local effective ideas and practices by engaging those from elsewhere. So local ideas in Africa today do include aspirations to romantic love and also to companionate marriage, and there's plenty of evidence of this in popular culture, for example. Popular music across the continent uh, includes myriad songs on love and longing. Love um, is highly represented in Bollywood and Nollywood, including romantic love in marriage, and of course in the Latin American soap operas that everybody rushes home to watch on any given day in any West African city. So in other words, there are very good reasons to take people's aspirations seriously when they speak about the desire for companionate marriage and for the presence and intimacy of spouses, even when other imperatives draw people in a different direction. In the early literature on kinship in Africa, not much was said either on how marriage forms and other family practices would change over time. This um, has changed, obviously, 
there isn't time to go into the new kinship studies which have re-emerged following what might call kinship's debacle in the wake of David Schneider's uh, fundamental critique in the 70s and 80s. But new kinship studies have been fundamental in moving the focus away from systems, <laughs> from structure, and to practice, experience, and change over time. A little bit before the new kinship studies, um, there was David Parkin and David Nyamoya's edited volume on transformations of African marriage, which had already helped to bring temporality back into studies of family and to move things beyond the earlier debate on dissent versus alliance. But even then, the focus was still very much on systems. Now, Lynn Bryden's work has also been very important in this field, and it's very good to see that is being celebrated here by the Cadbury program. In her work on changes in household composition and women's work in um, Ghana, in Av Avatime, Avatime, Avatime. Um, for example, she analyzed the effect of regional migration, divorce, and changes in the imperative for women to be married, or again, new forms of child fosterage at a time when it wasn't yet mainstream to do so. So in continuity with Lynn's work, in her recent book, The Scattered Family, Cathy Ko, um, and the book is from 2014, Cathy Ko discusses what happens when Ghanaian men and women settle in the US and struggle to raise families there. Just like many other migrants, Ghanaians suffer from the difficulty of getting visas to bring relatives over, even children, from the absence of grandparents and extended family, the necessity to work several jobs, the high cost of child and health care, concerns over the safety of young people, and the fear that an American education will prevent children from becoming virtuous individuals. So what many of them do is either leave their children in Ghana or send them back later. In Ghana, some of them are sent to private boarding schools, while others are being cared for by grand grandparents, aunts, and uncles, or even more recently by paid carers who are not related to them. And Cathy Cole shows how these families adapt existing repertoires of what she calls distributed parenthood in southern Ghana, which date back to pre-colonial times, but which changed themselves over the course of the 20th century as more women moved away from, for cash cropping, for example, or for education or salaried work. But most importantly, Cathy Ko's work is among a grow, growing body of uh, literature which focuses not only on continuity and change in family practices and ideologies, but also on how people across the generations live with this scattering and how they make sense of it. My current work is informed by this literature, but I'm particularly interested in the interplay between affective relations and different forms of presence and absence. Because migration involves absence, transnational families can help us to reconsider how people experience distance and closeness in relation to loved ones who are not physically present most of the time. And also, people's experience of absence helps to understand what is important to them. And indeed, some of the anthropological literature on materiality makes exactly this point in relation to materiality. Look for absent objects and what, how people relate to them and will better understand what is important to them. So what I also try to do with this, um, what I also try to add to this body of work then is to look not only at the transnational family relationships as such, but also at the new affective bonds that people establish where they live. So migrants often uh, develop new relationships where they live, sometimes even new families with new children, and these, of course, shape their relationships with families back home. So remember that I started with mixed marriage between Senegalese and Europeans, and I worked my way back to the family relationships between those Senegalese partners and their families back home. So what I'm trying to bring with this, to this uh, growing literature is to look at those new bonds, those new uh, relationships that people have established where they live, and which are often 
uh, often have a kind of evanescent, very distant presence in the narratives that one might collect from, um, from Senegal, from the African places of origin. But I want now to turn to the specific context of Senegal, where I suggest that some forms of absence and mediation have been valued, like I said, in some contexts, not all. And this is visible, for example, in uh, the relationship between griots and their patrons, which I'm sure will be very familiar to everyone here, and also in the wedding process. But perhaps what is valued is not so much the absence of persons in the griot patron relationship, um, not so much the absence of persons of a certain status as the mediation over their presence. But I still find it to find it interesting to think about mediation in, um, as a way of, of thinking about absence or certain forms of absence. So, for example, among one of speakers and several, uh, several other populations in the region, there is um, status, stratification, which has often been compared to a caste system from anthropology in colonial times when the comparison was made uh, with India. So not everybody agrees that it's a caste system, but this is now very much the term that people use in Senegal. Um, in any case, there are three main um, groups, and what is important to uh, the distinction that is important here is mainly the distinction, for my purposes, between um, freeborn, uh, called Gear, and the Nino, or more generally people of the trade, so who include artisans of different categories, and who include griots, or Gewel. And Gewel in Wolof means literally the one for whom a circle is made. Is made. Now, they epitomize the Nino. Other categories can also mediate, can also act as ritual experts, but really the Gewel are the archetype, if you want, of the Nino. And they're particularly interesting in ritual contexts for that reason. When people talk about Nino, they really often think about um, the Gewel. <coughs> so these categories are largely hereditary, but not exclusively. Status also has to be cultivated to have real social value. And one important way in which this may be done is through a degree of um, absence and through mediation. So, for example, the less someone is seen during important events, the higher their status is likely to be. During a public event, a high-status gear or a sheikh, um, Sufi uh, Muslim leader, would typically arrive late, be seated away, from the crowd so as to be simply glimpsed and not seen, not fully seen. So the person in focus is physically present, if sometimes only briefly, but there is an absence of voice and movement. A gewel will be paid to perform an oratory in the praise of this person, and if this person has to deliver a speech, then the gewel will repeat their speech while embellishing it transmission with embellishment, mediation, called jotteli. Meanwhile, the, the care, the political leader, the chef, is seated in almost complete stillness, which is often amplified by the voluminous layers of clothing, very starched clothing that people wear on these occasions. They will have to sit in a dignified and restrained manner. And the, this picture of the griot that you see here She's actually um, holding a list of gifts during um, a naming ceremony because they're also the ritual experts who uh, keep a record of the gifts of money and cloth that circulate during weddings and naming ceremonies and which are extremely important in uh, validating those ceremonies and in the making of relations of affinity between different uh, families. So I thought um, Fiona McLaughlin's descriptions here captured very well this interaction between a girl and the person uh, for whom uh, mediation is made. In this case, it's about uh, Sufi Sheikh. She says, typically the marabou is seated on a platform and speaks in a low voice. They actually quite, they, they almost mumble. 
so that the Gewell must draw close to be able to hear. After a few phrases, the Gewell addresses the crowd with the phrase Nena, he said, pronounced in a distinctive declamatory style, and proceeds to paraphrase with embellishments what the Marabou has just said. And not only do griots speak in a very emphatic way, they also move a lot more than gear or chefs do. So there is a contrast between movement, uh, emphatic, metaphoric speech, speaking loudly, and what is um, for people of high status an almost evanescent presence. And this is also um, captured in um, the relationship between status and, and being uh, and restraint is also captured in those uh, wall of proverbs. Kilifa du Wahbatam Bijib, a leader. So Kilifa is it's translated as a leader, is really uh, the authority, particularly someone uh, who has the authority in the group or in the family. A leader does not raise his voice. Or Kiwah. The one who has spoken has said nothing. It is the one who has relayed speech who has spoken. So mediation is important, but actually status comes from the one who has not spoken. And the value of mediation is also visible in family ceremonies, but here absence is even more strongly marked. It's not just partial invisibility, it's actual absence. Well, of weddings... Um, involve a long process in several stages from the presentation of the bride wealth, the wauga, to the first child's naming ceremony. So the wedding process is seen as properly completed only when the first child's naming ceremony um, has been held, which means that in marriages where there are no children, you might say that socially uh, it's not being considered as, as a properly completed process and is quite catastrophic. So for, there are several stages, and uh, they might or might not involve a town hall wedding. Now when people live abroad, as this couple, for example, um, the town hall wedding was celebrated in France, but a Muslim wedding at the mosque was held in Senegal in absentia and organized by the family of the groom with representatives for the European wife who were chosen from among his friends in Senegal. But what is really important is the tak, is the Muslim ceremony, which involves uh, an imam's benediction and rep third party representation at the mosque. So the tak will be held after the afternoon prayer, mostly at the mosque, but it could also be at the home of a knowledgeable Muslim. And men from both families will be present, as well as two witnesses on each side. Um, an imam, usually, or a cleric, will recite appropriate verses from the Quran, but in most cases, neither spouse is present. And this has been very well described in, uh, in Ismail Moyes' uh, 2011 thesis, who's an anthropologist um, who is at Nanterre in Paris, and in his forthcoming book, which is called De l'argent aux valeurs. So when you ask people about why this absence, they do not um, have very elaborate explanations, though I was sometimes told that this had to do with the fact that uh, this was a Muslim tradition, and that this had to do with the fact that the spouses had to be hidden away from public view and be as still and quiet as possible for the union to be blessed at precisely the moment when the tak is being pronounced. And tak also means to tie in Wolof. But even more intriguingly, you might say, fine, at the mosque it's a family affair, but what about the European-style reception that people usually hold on the same evening or a few days later? Well, in that reception, very often the groom is not present either. Um, most, more and more middle-class urban couples will hold one such reception where the bride will wear a white dress, where guests will bring a gift and be served a buffet dinner, and where people will dance to the music played by a DJ. But the groom isn't there most of the time, or he might appear later in the evening. So what happens is that the bride will still open the dance, 
on the dance floor, but not with the crew, with his representative, who is often a very close friend or might be his brother. And this is reflected in wedding albums, which are always kept by women. So they look exactly like European wedding albums, except that the man posing with the bride is not the groom. He's his mediator, his representative. The groom sometimes can surprise his wife during the course of the evening, but usually he's not there at all. But because many younger couples now want to project the image of companionate marriage, and with cheap access to digital, digital technologies, urban photographers have now started reinserting the groom into wedding albums. So the groom is virtually present in the memento that is the album, and the photographers are very creative um, in, in uh, writing appropriate messages, um, darling, I love you, and all kinds of messages that um, bride and groom might have wanted to express had they been together on the day of the wedding. Um, so he's virtually present in the memento that is the album, even though he was physically absent on the day, a very obvious example of entanglement between presence and absence. And of course, it's particularly appropriate and convenient for the many cases where a wedding is being organized, arranged between a migrant and um, a woman back home so that the family keeps control over the proceedings, even though the groom may be in Europe, in the US, and may be not even have been in Senegal for many years. So this fits very well with the diasporic character of Senegalese society, and it's likely that this kind of mediation has been actively maintained so that the families may retain a degree of control over migrants, and particularly mothers and sisters. So in her 2012 book, uh, Muslim Families in Global Senegal, Beth Bogenhagen shows how women particularly uh, achieve this control by redistributing the bright wealth accumulated by migrant men. So the sisters of migrants will be the ones handing over bright wealth on behalf of their brothers. And mothers-in-law who receive mothers-in-law or sisters who will receive um, the bright wealth are the ones who will redistribute it. So women keep control of the money in these very important exchanges. And the same women often play a very important role in choosing a bride for their brothers or sons so that uh, female control is almost complete even in the men's absence. And there's quite um, um, widespread circulation of photographs of young unmarried women and recordings of family ceremonies which are then sent to migrants abroad and they're being encouraged to choose wives from um, these um, photographs who might be the sisters from among the sisters' friends or who might be young women who were present at family ceremonies and who are quite keen to be seen by migrants. And I, I, I only realized this, um, I found out when I was doing my dance research because I filmed family ceremonies because I was interested in the dancing that was going on in the circle and people would say, no, no, forget about the dance. Go around and film each person <laughs> seated around the circle because you're going back to Europe, so you take the tape with you. So in the same way, um, many wedding photographs are portraits of the bride on her own, like uh, this one on the left, even when the groom is in the same town, which was the case here. But the groom and his family are likely to have paid for the European-style wedding dress, like this one, for, or for the expensive Senegalese outfits the bride will be wearing. And so in a sense, he is present through the wealth he is transferring to his wife in the same way as migrant husbands are expected to fill their absence with material wealth. There is even an expectation that this wealth would increase with the amount of time that they will be away, which makes many migrants quite desperate because there is an expectation that, well, you've been away for so many years, so you, know, you should have accumulated so, so much by then. And of course, the level of the expected bright wealth will increase accordingly. 
This is a motif that is repeated at baby naming ceremonies on the eighth day after birth, where the presence and status of the father are suggested through the outfits and jewelry the mother is wearing. But as you can see on this um, montage, which is actually the cover photograph of the same woman's uh, first, or actually second, baby naming ceremony. So it's mainly about her in her different outfits, uh, the shining mother, there is a small photograph of the baby, and the father is, has a very evanescent presence here. <laughs> um, he's just here at the bottom. But everyone who knows his family knows that this is an extremely wealthy and important man, and so he is very much present through the outfits, the, the montage, and even the name of the photographer who has done his montage, who is known to be quite expensive and who's a favorite among the middle class, but he doesn't need to be seen very much. And even on the day, he wasn't uh, very present at all. So naming ceremonies, too, are dominated um, by women. Um, and even when fathers are in the country, Otherwise, when they're away, when the whole family is away, then those naming ceremonies can be celebrated um, in absentia. So I've, um, I know of um, Senegalese men who live abroad with foreign wives or Senegalese wives who absolutely wanted to have their baby's naming ceremony carried out in Senegal rather than in a Muslim community here. And so what's possible to do then is to have uh, to do it by over the phone. So you will have, uh, this is not another woman on her baby naming ceremony day. You will have uh, an appropriate gathering, um, festive gathering, as if people were actually in the country. The only difference is that the couple and the baby are not present, they're abroad, and the imam will then whisper the name of the baby into the baby's ear by phone. Um, and everybody has mobile phones now, so it's actually quite easily done. And sometimes the, the, the couple may even follow their own baby naming ceremony over Skype. And the same with weddings. So people just leave um, Skype on if they're in, the ceremony is being held in a place where there is internet connection in Dakar, then they will just leave on Skype so that can, people can follow their own ceremonies from afar. And I think this one of the aspects that's quite interesting in, in thinking about presence and absence today is precisely that there is this circulation of images and there is at least the illusion that physical absence can be compensated for to some degree by this virtual presence that is now possible through these new technologies. So in the wedding process, it seems that physical absence is valued at least so long as it is properly mediated and so long as it suggests eventual presence. But it must be compensated for by material wealth in the form of money, cloth, or expensive items of fashion. So this was the baby naming ceremony of a famous um, young Marabou and his... Um, wife who absolutely looks like a bride, but she was the mother of uh, the baby. And he wasn't uh, in the country at the time, but it was very important that this um, be done um, properly and that his um, spiritual authority and wealth be demonstrated even in, um, in the Senegalese tabloid press. So this um, value of absence is not restricted to family ceremonies or to the real patron relationship. Even in everyday life, certain forms of absence um, are valued, but in a different way. So for example, it is common for married couples to live apart, and particularly in polygamous marriages. And polygamy um, was predicted to disappear after independence. It has um, become less prevalent over time. It's true, less prevalent than it was in the 60s and 70s when at the time two-thirds of married women lived in polygamous unions, but it's still one-third of Senegalese women today 
um, one third of Sydney's women who are married and between the age and 15 and 49 who are in polygamous unions. So if you add those who are older than 49 and who are not yet widowed, um, which is often the case because there is on average a gap of 10 to 15 years between the wife and her husband, the figures are actually even higher. Which doesn't mean that people always live in polygamous relationships all the time. It's just um, people tend to move in and out of, of polygamy as marriages break down and men take new wives. But at least this is what people said when they were asked. This is what women were said when they were asked in a survey context, do you have a co-wife? And one third of them said yes. So many of these uh, polygamous unions will involve two households, sometimes, quite often, in different parts of the country or across borders. And even in monogamous couples, many of them choose not to live together for a number of years, and that's for multiple reasons. Sometimes it's because the wedding process has not been completed and the turning in ceremony has not been carried out because people did not have a proper place to live or did not have the means to do so. It can be because women enjoy preserving their autonomy or want to keep, um, to, to keep living with their own families. But there is a definite propensity among Senegalese couples to live apart together, as it's called. And this may be one of the reasons why, until recently, Senegalese couples were more likely to live apart in transnational marriages than other nationalities in Africa, as was shown by the MAFE survey um, in 2008-2009, which showed that 10 years after the departure of one of the spouses, up to 81% of the couples, the Senegalese couples surveyed, still live in separate countries. And that was quite a lot higher um, than other nationalities, for example, Ghanaians or Congolese. It may also be because it was more likely that Senegalese, um, the Senegalese migrants were undocumented for example, the Congolese, um, Congolese from the DRC, a number of them will have refugee status and therefore the opportunity to reunify with their families. Undocumented migrants cannot reunify, they cannot bring um, relatives with them. And Senegalese migrants living in Spain and Italy uh, have often been undocumented for many, many years. But still, even among those who had the papers and who could reunify, many chose not to and the figures do not explain why. Also, when it comes to children, um, what Cathy Cord calls distributed parenthood, more often called child fosterage in the West African literature, is quite common. There are no actual figures, but I would say that more than half of my friends and research participants have spent several years of their childhood away from their biological parents, and this for all kinds of reasons. Divorce or separation figured for quite prominently. Parents who spent time abroad also. Death or illness. Uh, the conflicts that arise from polygamy, or even as protection from malevolent spirits. So physical absence comes in many different forms in world of family life, and although not always positive, there is a sense in which it is tied to social reproduction under the right circumstances, when appropriately mediated and when compensated for materially. But presence is important too, since a marriage will not produce children without any intimacy between the spouses, for example. So one might say that what matters is the dialectic between presence and absence and striking the appropriate balance between the two. Now, this does not mean that people enjoy the absence of spouses, parents or children, even when it's comp being compensated for. And there isn't any reason either to believe that people lived with this particularly well in the past. So there is a sense in the regional literature that because um, of distributed parenthood and the circulation of children, this has been unproblematic and people have just moved away from families and have lived 
quite happily with us. I'm not sure that that would have been the case even in the past, but we just don't know much about how people experienced these situations then. The historical dimension of this um, is an area in which I will be doing more research, but from, collected the li from collecting the life histories of Senegalese individuals in the past 14 years and from visits to Dakar earlier on, my sense is that there used to be a difference between the way in which people made sense of separation from parents or children on the one hand and separation from spouses on the other. So different forms of absence for different categories of people were experienced differently. But I want to suggest that with growing aspirations to companionate marriage and nuclear families, and with migration increasingly perceived as a sacrifice with a very, very uncertain outcome, both forms of separation are now perceived negatively, and people are increasingly questioning the, uh, the value of absence more generally. So many individuals who have been sent away to live with relatives at an age when they were old enough to remember talk to me about their scattered childhoods in very painful terms. And this is also mirrored in Katiko's uh, book on Ghana, where she argues that distributed parenthood has come to be seen in a more <coughs> negative light throughout the 20th century, and especially among the middle classes. So one man, now in his mid-30s, for example, told me about being sent from living with both his parents in a small town in southeastern Senegal to live with an older half-sibling in the car when he was aged eight. He talked about this as the most painful period in his life and as the reason why he subsequently failed in school. This, has not, this had not been his parents' original intention, but when two of his brothers died of a tragic death a few years apart from each other, a diviner told his mother that malevolent spirits, jinn, were trying to take her sons and that she would lose them all if they stayed with her. Um, and that was particularly tragic because both of them, uh, with a few years apart, died by falling into wells as they were playing and broke their skull. And the second time that this happened, um, she barely survived it, obviously, and, and something, had, something quite radical had to be done. So she sent her remaining sons to the car to live with the older children she had born from a previous marriage. But my friend says that although he understood his parents' decision, he never really recovered from the separation. <coughs> Another Dakara, now in his early 40s and a very well-known performer, told me about being taken to visit relatives in a town about two hours drive east of Dakar when he was aged 11, along with his younger brother. We'd been talking for a while at his home that day and his wife sat next to him. He'd spoken very calmly about difficult episodes to do with his parents' broken marriage and about his father's violence towards his mother. But as he remembered that particular moment, he became very emotional and said what I thought would be a two-month school holiday with the family became my life for the next eight years. And then he broke into tears. I didn't really know what to do, so I left the room to give him time to compose himself. And we resumed the conversation. And this gave me a sense of déjà vu because it was the case that every time one of my friends or research participants talked about being sent away as a child, often without any warning, people became extremely emotional. No one who was old enough to remember that moment remembered this with any kind of fondness. People do not often use the language of trauma, but it was very obvious that this had been very traumatic breaks in people's childhoods. On the other hand, when I lived in Dakar between 2002 and 2004, migrants were talked about as particularly attractive husbands. So when it came to spouses, there was clearly a difference. A migrant husband represented the promise of a regular income in the form of remittances, which fitted well 
with the notion that love and care can be expressed in the form of gifts rather than physical presence, which has been documented throughout Africa. And the allure of migrant husbands was such that women often joked about sending their best portrait photographs to relatives abroad in the hope that they would be passed on, as I described. And also they used the same term as that which is used to talk about valuable commodities like imported cars and fridges. The term is venant in French, or even venant d'Italie, which was used for cars and fridges, and potentially also husbands. And in fact, some of those men who did not try their luck abroad for a few years were seen as losers, and it was very difficult for them to find a social space in which to be somebody, because women in particular would brand them as you know, losers and say, he hasn't even tried, imagine. And were not very attractive on the marriage market. But there was a change, I think, which coincided with a changing climate for immigrants in the EU from around the mid, the early to mid 2000s onwards. Partly, uh, immigration legislation has intensified, and this has thrown many migrants into illegality for much, much longer than previously. And we know that the intensification of immigration legislation throughout Europe has had a, a really dramatic impact on people's ability to become documented. Denmark was probably the first country in 2000 to introduce extremely uh, strict um, rules for marriage migration, that is called family reunification, uh, regular migration more generally, and many countries, including Britain, have taken, um, have since introduced some aspects of um, the Danish experience. So for example, the income requirement that we have now in Britain, we've had since 2012, um, direct reference was made to the Danish experience with the argument that if you make it more difficult for people to come and become documented and also to bring spouses from abroad, then you'll be better able to integrate those who are already here. Not that there is any evidence of that, but that was um, the argument. So what that means is that marriage to a citizen or resident, uh, although it's very difficult, it's actually become one of the very few remaining routes to legal status if you are a migrant coming from Africa. Paradoxically, for many Senegalese men, so it's not paradoxical, I should say, but that means that for many Senegalese men, the perception is that the only way to make a success of their migration and to care for families back home is to actually establish a new family in the country of residence. And this, of course, generates competing material and affective obligations in which the original relationship can get smothered, as I will illustrate with a case shortly. And even if men remain single while abroad, it doesn't really help because often that means they'll remain undocumented, won't be able to travel home for visits, and that means that marriage won't be um, uh, productive. Uh, people will not be able to have children, and it will often result in a divorce if there are no children coming after too many years. The mid-2000s corresponded also um, coincided with a, an increase in EU funding international campaigns um, against migration, particularly migration, irregular migration by sea, sea journeys, which was very much um, talked about in Dakar around that period, and which led to a new awareness that migration by boat, uh, those very dangerous sea journeys, were very likely to be deadly. So the allure of a migrant who might uh, turn up dead between uh, Senegal and the Canaries, of course, was not uh, great. Economic decline in Southern Europe from 2007 has also meant that those <coughs> Senegalese migrants who were settled in Southern Europe, and there were quite um, a lot in Spain, Italy, and Portugal, found it more difficult to keep jobs and to transfer this material wealth back home that was expected of them. Fewer remittances, and in fact, some of the families in Senegal 
um, things were reversed in some cases and families had to send money um, to migrants to help them survive. And the last factor was the increased um, availability of high-speed internet and new communication technologies, which led to a very different experience of physical absence. Um, Skype, Viber, WhatsApp, Facebook, everybody, all transnational families use these new media, and it makes it possible for people to create virtual spaces of togetherness and even intimacy. Even people even do shopping together. I've seen this. A friend of mine usually goes to the shops, take photos of the uh, shelves of shoes, and sends them to his wife, which ones do you want? And within a few minutes, she has <laughs> chosen the shoes. Now, in Senegal, they wouldn't shop together because people don't do that. But actually, in this situation, they value this experience of shopping together, which they never had before. And that's made um, possible by the new media. And of course, there are people leaving Skype on in their bedrooms so that they have some kind of evening routine together, in, again, in a way that might not even happen in Senegal, because people do not actually spend a lot of time together. Um, men and women don't spend a lot of time together, particularly because houses are often quite crowded, so there isn't a lot of time to be intimate together as a couple. On the other hand, this means that many wives of migrants feel that they are now under more surveillance than ever, and certainly more than when their husbands lived nearby. Cameras, Skype, uh, now you can reach people at any time of day and night and ask them what you're doing, where are you? Uh, they actually have more control than when they're um, around and more suspicion. So it's not, it's a very ambiguous role that these new technologies play. And of course we do not have much time there, it's too early to assess the extent to which these changes will affect family ideas um, and the value of different forms of absence.